have a couple of things to take care of in terms of housekeeping, right, I guess, this evening. Um, I just wanted to say welcome to everyone, both in person and digital, to our this evening's edition of Historically Speaking. And we're delighted to present um, Dr. Peniel Joseph in a wonderful discussion of his latest work, The Third Reconstruction. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you all for coming. Um, as you might imagine, well, I'm Deirdre Cross, and I'm the Assistant Director for uh, Public Programs here at the museum, and I am not Robert Samuels. <laughs> Uh, and unfortunately, he was not able to make it this evening. So we have a slightly different format, and I'll pose a few questions yeah. to, um, to, to Peniel, and then we will um, invite, rather than have you write your questions on cards, we'll direct you to the midpoint of the, of the Oprah Winfrey Theater, and we have two mics there, and you can pose questions. Um, and those of you who are joining us digitally, if you would just place your questions in the chat and someone will deliver those to us and we'll get, um, we'll get Peniel's uh, answers and insights for you. So let's, let's get started. Again, thank you for coming. Thank you, Pat. And um, one of the things that I think um, is most interesting about your book is your approach to discussing Reconstruction as part of a series, whether we really intended it or not. There's a first and second. Um, yeah. Uh, and so I was wondering if you would go over that with a, for us, the what you think of your insights into the first and then the second, and how you and how you coined this as the third reconstruction. Oh, certainly. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, and thank you, Deirdre, for <laughs> serving as the interlocutor <laughs> for the evening. Um, this, this idea of reconstruction, uh, on some levels, is both literal and figurative, right? So we've had, I think, three periods of reconstruction in American history. Um, sometimes people think the first reconstruction is a period that a lot of people are taught in school, but they're really not. Um, that's the period from 1865 to 1898 after racial slavery. And in a lot of ways, that story is the story of us as Americans trying to become this multiracial democracy. So the book is really part memoir, part history, part cultural and political criticism, but it's really about stories and narratives we tell ourselves. And when we think about that first Reconstruction period, the, the two main stories that come out of that period are Reconstructionists versus Redemptionists. And those are really the concepts that sort of drive the entire book. And Reconstructionists are those who are believers and supporters in multiracial democracy. And so a great example of a Reconstructionist is not just somebody like President Lincoln or Frederick Douglass or um, famous people. We're really talking about just everyday, ordinary people who believed that slavery was something that was morally and politically wrong and were proponents of abolition. And when we think about abolition, Du Bois called this abolition democracy, not just the abolition of slavery, but the abolition of systems of punishment, systems of exploitation. And in a lot of ways, Reconstruction remakes the entire United States for everyone, right? So, Black dignity and citizenship is at the center of that remaking. But when we think about the Reconstruction Amendments, ending racial slavery, birthright citizenship, and the Equal Protection Clause, and then voting rights, initially for black men, those become fundamental rights for all Americans in the, in the coming decades. So when we think about that first Reconstruction, it's going to be both reimagining American democracy, but it's gonna be in conflict with redemptionist visions. This idea of the redeemer South, that's the idea of a racially violent reckoning to turn back the clock, to turn back the hands of time. Redemptionists are advocates of white supremacy, but they're also advocates of utilizing the government against democracy. So when we think about authoritarianism, when we think about issues of, uh, people talk about nullification and, and nullifying uh, the federal government's efforts at bringing citizenship and dignity to black Americans, but really to all Americans, 
That's where you're coming out of. And so that first reconstruction period is important and instructive for us because even though you get historically black colleges and universities, you get um, black elected officials, really over 2,000 across the South. Uh, we focus on the people in Congress, mm -hmm. uh, but we really had people who were sheriffs and magistrates and aldermen and assemblymen, all men because women couldn't hold elected offices. So we could, we could talk about the imperfections of that Reconstruction period too, even though people like Frederick Douglass were feminists, believed in women's rights and women's equality irrespective of, of color or gender. Um, that Reconstruction period is really upended by racial violence and racial terror, right? And so the whole notion of black codes, sharecropping, convict lease systems, this all comes into being during the Reconstruction decades. So in a way, Reconstruction sets up this pattern, I, I call it an unhappy pattern in the book, of racial progress followed by backlash, racial progress followed by backlash. The second Reconstruction, of course, the high points are 1954 to 1968, and that's what I call the heroic period of the Civil Rights Movement. And when we think about that Civil Rights Movement, it really becomes Reconstruction sequel because in a lot of ways, what happens during the Civil Rights Movement is that Reconstructionists eventually win the narrative war. They win the argument. Now, winning an argument doesn't mean you win it 100%, because in certain ways in a democracy, that's not possible. People are constantly sort of revisiting um, different decisions, different ideals. The way in which we treat one group of people in 1960 can be completely different in 2060. Yes, and I, I wanted to ask you some quest, a question about that because um, you mentioned uh, the, the America of your youth when you were growing up. Mm -hmm. um, Ronald Reagan was president. Yes. Um, I'm a little bit older, so <laughs> but when I came of age, Jimmy Carter was president, and he was the first president that I, the first person I voted for in the in the 1980s. And it's interesting that um, you talk about winning the winning the narrative. And I, I guess I was a real believer the way a lot of people are. I never thought that voting rights would be challenged. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, focusing on reproductive rights was the thing to do because I didn't have to worry about that. And now look, we're, it's a retrenchment of a lot of things. So I. I was wondering well, um, about this in uh, the third reconstruction. Um. You know, I think the third reconstruction, the four pivot points that I describe in the book are the election of Barack Obama, um, the rise of BLM 1.0 mm -hmm. in the aftermath of Trayvon Martin, um, the rise of Donald Trump and MAGA in 2016, and then really everything that happens in 2020. Uh, because 2020, you see all these different juxtapositions that really recall the first Reconstruction even more than the second Reconstruction. So a lot of times people were comparing what was happening in 2020, uh, including January 6th by 2021, um, to the 1960s. But the better comparison was really the 1860s, the 1870s, and the 1880s, because we, we had seen that kind of political violence and we had also seen that kind of political progress happening all at the same time, simultaneously. So in a lot of ways, when we think about this third reconstruction, it's both an extension of that second reconstruction because you're not gonna get Obama without the passage of the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, all these different victories, but it's also the end of something too because when we think about the Shelby v. Holder decision, that really sort of ends voting rights as we had known it previously from 1965 to 2013. So really 2013, right in the midst of that third reconstruction, you see the end of a kind of racial justice consensus. And throughout the book, you know, I talk about the way in which Barack Obama, um, Black Lives Matter, they, they, they have a different conception of each other, from each other, of, of what this idea of reconstruction is. You know, Obama, is a mainstream reconstructionist. He's got an idea about citizenship from above, and they're talking about dignity from below. And by 2020, everybody's in on the conversation after George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. And what's really remarkable by 2020 is that you really have the, the most people, period, mm 
uh, who ever come out in support of Reconstructionist sentiment. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what, what, your, what are your thoughts as it relates to what are now issues emerging from environmental justice? Where do you think that that, how do you think that plays into um, the thought behind, your thinking behind the third reconstruction? Well, you know, I think environmental justice is huge. And I think this, at the center of struggles for black citizenship and dignity have always been environmental justice movements, right? And so I think in a lot of ways, certain things we, we don't think of as being um, centered around race are actually centered around race. When we think about environmental justice and Flint, Michigan and water policy and, and um, children who have disproportionate asthma and disproportionate issues, a lot of that is skewed along racial lines, like black, um, indigenous, uh, Latino uh, children, Latinx children t tend to be more um, prone to having you know, lead poisoning, um, being connected to asbestos, being connected to environmentally unsafe conditions. And that really goes back to that first period of Reconstruction. Reconstruction is where we have a, a W.E.B. Du Bois, who I, I begin the book with an epigraph, who's the, um, the dean of, of, of African American studies. Um, he calls Reconstruction a moment where, where black people um, stood in the political sun for, for a time, um, only to sort of have it pulled, pulled away, right? The rug pulled from out from under them. And so in a lot of ways, even when we think about the environment, when we think about, you know, black women have coined the term reproductive justice, right? These are issues that we, we don't necessarily think of as being centered around race, but that they, they actually are, uh, just because of the outcomes are so disparate and the reasons the outcomes are different, yes, it's class, but it's also race is the driving force be, behind the disparate outcomes, or basically just the inequality that persists and pervades. Wow. Well, I, um, you and I had talked a little before um, we began the program yep. this evening, and I, I wanted to ask you about the memoir aspect of your book and its importance uh, to advancing uh, your narrative. Oh, definitely. Thank you, Deidre. <laughs> you know, I talk about the book is dedicated to my mother, and I, um, you know, I, I talk about her a lot throughout the book, and I talk about growing up in New York City and sort of the lessons that I was taught um, through, through my childhood. Uh, I'm the proud son of Haitian immigrants, so if anybody's Haitian besides my family in the front row, <laughs> sac passe. Um, and, you know, I, I think that your, your family is the first story you get. So the book is really about stories and the powers of stories, because stories are more than just sort of this oral tradition that we pass on from generation to generation. Stories are how we define ourselves, and stories are how we co-create the world together. So the stories we tell actually impact our politics, it impacts our religion, it impacts the education our kids receive, it impacts whether we're gonna go to war or not, mm -hmm. it impacts who we care about or not. So stories are fundamentally sort of the most important aspect of, of society and building society, and that's why people have such huge fights over history, right? Because if you tell history in a certain way, that can be a very, very uh, progressive way in a way that liberates people, or you can tell history and stories in a way that says some groups of people are gonna be punished more than other groups of people, and that the very story you're telling justifies the outcome. That's why stories are so, so important, right? And so, I wanted to talk about my own story and how my own story growing up in New York City as a young black boy really impacted how I came to understand the power of stories. But then I juxtaposed that with 2020 because what was so interesting to me about 2020 or one aspect was the fact that so many people became interested in history, right? So many people became interested in stories about American history, about African American history, and how crucial that was to the current circumstances and what was going on in the spring and summer of 2020. And I think that was the first time I really saw that, you know, in a lot of ways, everyone needs history 
and a story that can be a balm for, for whatever ails them, really, right? And in so many ways, we are in this constant struggle, and it's not just um, black and white, but people who are indigenous, people from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Mexico, Central America, South America, uh, people who are Irish, people who are Jewish, Muslim. Mm -hmm. We're in a constant tension in this country over whose stories matter the most, right? And one of the things I argue in the book is that by centering the stories of black people, and in this case, I really talk about black women throughout, we're able to think about democracy more expansively, uh, not because somehow they're better than anybody else, but they've experienced certain things and been marginalized in certain ways that provide them really a clear-eyed look to think about democracy as expansive as possible, to think about dignity as expansive as possible, to think about citizenship as expansive as possible so that other generations wouldn't face and endure the suffering that they did, even though they were resilient in that suffering, right? So in a lot of ways, even doing this project made me think about um, people like um, Toni Morrison and people like uh, Audre Lorde. Um, I anchor it with, with Angela Davis because of the essay she writes about black women from prison in 1971 um, during racial slavery. And I think that's this really incredibly important essay because she's really pushing back against the Moynihan Report and this idea that it's sort of black women's fault that there's poverty in the black community, right? This whole pathologizing of, of the black community. And one of the things I think is really um, poignant about Black Lives Matter is the way in which they really challenge um, President Obama and the entire country to think about black people differently. And what if we imagined that all black people, irrespective of having made mistakes, are human beings, right? Because when we, when we approach each other in the context of what Martin Luther King Jr. called the beloved community, we don't, we don't demonize each other. We realize that all of us can make mistakes, right? And we don't connect the mistakes that our family members make to biology or some kind of genetic problem that they have, right? We just say, hey, you made a mistake and we're gonna all work on it and, and, and sort of make you better, right? And I think one of the interesting parts about this third reconstruction with the stories that were told, and I talk about Stacey Abrams, I talk about Tamika Mallory, Alicia Garza, I talk about an earlier generation like Audre Lorde, Barbara Smith, Angela Davis, Kathy Cohen, all these different groups of people, is that they told us a different story about the black community, right? You know, they told us a different story, and I think that was a really important and powerful story because not everybody's going to have the access of Barack and Michelle Obama. Not everybody is gonna to go to Princeton University or Punahou or Harvard Law. We can't all get into Harvard Law, black, white, anything, right? So that can't, they can't be the litmus test of who is sort of the exemplar in society. The exemplar is never the outlier who does the best. The exemplar is all of us who are just trying our best, right? Not people who are the best, right? We all look up to those people and we say, wow, that is awesome. But we don't ever think to ourselves that we could be those people, nor should we have to. And that's one of the stories that flows throughout the book. And what's so interesting is when we think about these three periods of reconstruction, people have been battling over the story of us, the story that we tell each other about being American since the Republic was born, but what's so important about 1865, that's the first time we attempt to think about America as a true multiracial democracy, right? Where what if everyone's stories mattered? And I, <clears throat> along those lines, I, you know, if you could spend a little more time talking about the narrative wars, perhaps in the context of what is happening now where there are attempts to discount uh, the narratives of some, of some Americans over others. Oh, absolutely. I think one of the things that's happened in 2021 and 2022 
when we think about everything from voter suppression, the idea of critical race theory, um, this is the continuation of the narrative wars that start in the 1860s. Uh, sometimes in the 1980s, I'm old enough to remember the cultural wars where people were um, pushing back against the rise of ethnic studies and black studies, Latino studies, women's studies. Uh, Harold Bloom and other people, Arthur Schlesinger, they were calling it the disuniting of America. And people were very upset over this idea of what was then called multiculturalism, right? It was called multiculturalism. And now the boogeyman is critical race theory. But what people have to understand, and I argue in the book, telling a critical story about American history is not going to teach kids to somehow hate the country. Um, our children, our society is stronger than that, right? Telling them a critical story of about American history, and you know, Martin Luther King Jr. called it a bitter but beautiful struggle, means that you're actually including um, good parts of American mm -hmm. history. You're, you're including, um, when you think about racial slavery, there were white abolitionists and black abolitionists. When you think about um, the struggles to end racial segregation, there were um, Jewish stalwarts in that struggle, right? Um, when you think about the civil rights movement, there were Asian American Pacific Islanders, there were Latinx, there were farm workers who, who allied and, and organized. Um, people like Stokely Carmichael organized with Native American activists, right? So we could tell the story of America in the context of tragedy and triumph as we should, as critical thinkers, right? And that doesn't somehow turn us um, into folks who hate the country, right? If anything, I would argue that the people I describe in this book um, had a deep love of the country. Um, in, in many ways, this very resilient love because the country oftentimes refused to love them back, right? When you think about the racial violence, when you think about the racial segregation, all these different things that happened. Um, black people have fought in every war this country has had. Um, have been amongst the most you know, patriotic people in American history. And I think this idea of having a narrative that says that talking about black history uh, somehow is teaching kids to hate white people or to feel guilty or to feel bad, like I said, I think it, it discounts, one, the strength and the resilience and the intelligence of people, but two, it disallows us from having a deeper appreciation for the country we live in. Because that, the, the, the good and the bad parts of American history, that's our inheritance, right? And what we have to do with that is tell a different story, a story that can lead to better outcomes than what we've experienced so far. Well, thank you. That, that was really very, very inspiring. And it's a great time. Um, for those of you who might have questions for um, Peniel to um, come to the mic and, um, and ask him what's on your mind. <laughs> people are saying, nope, we got it. We got it. <laughs> OK, a couple of people are, are daring to. Well, people do their homework before <laughs> they come. So they, a lot of times they come in with questions. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, the third reconstruction. Give me an example of the first, second, and third. Like a, an example. What do you, what is the third? What do yeah. you think the third is? Yeah, so what, what, what I argue the third reconstruction is, is the era that we're living in now, from 2008 to the present. And the hinge points for me um, in the book are, going to be the election of Barack Obama, the rise of BLM 1.0 in 2013, the rise of MAGA and Trump in 2016, and then the rise of BLM 2.0 and the racial and political reckoning of 2020, and really all that's come after, everything from voter suppression and critical race theory, but at the same time, um, the, the appointment of the first black woman Supreme Court justice, uh, the first black woman vice president, 
Um, so that juxtaposition, that, that's the third. The first would be 1865 to 1898, so basically the ratification of the 13th Amendment all the way up until the Wilmington Massacre of November 8th, 9th, 10th of 1898, where a duly elected interracial government was really slaughtered by over a thousand um, uh, uh, white terrorists, some of whom were, were um, state militia, some of whom had been trained by Benjamin Tillman, the former senator and governor of South Carolina, who in the 1870s had led political coups against uh, black and white governments with the red shirts. Um, so I, I look at it as an 1865 to 1898 period. That also includes uh, the most black elected officials ever in American history up until that time. That includes the rise of black businesses and entrepreneurs and historically black colleges and universities, uh, churches and civic societies, farming cooperatives, right? So there's, there's both positive and negative. The second reconstruction, uh, I would argue, is the heroic period of the civil rights movement from 1954 to 68. Um, and that's gonna include everything from the Brown uh, v. Board of Education decision on May 17, 1954, all the way to the assassination of Dr. King. And in between the events are gonna be the, um, the lynching of Emmett Till on August 28, 1955, the 381-day bus boycott that's really led by uh, Rosa Parks and E.D. Nixon and Joanne Robinson. Dr. King becomes a 27-year-old mobilizer. The 1957 Little Rock Central High School crisis uh, that, that forces uh, Eisenhower to send federal troops to desegregate Little Rock Central High School. Uh, February 1st, 1960 is the start of the sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is now a civil rights museum, which leads to the founding of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, 1961 is the Freedom Rides, the start of the Freedom Rides uh, on May 4th, 1961. Um, and that's gonna lead to huge um, violence that makes the front page of really every newspaper by May 14th after a Greyhound bus is bombed outside of Anniston, Alabama. Uh, 1962 is when James Meredith uh, enrolls at the University of Mississippi. There's going to be three days of rioting in Oxford, Mississippi that's going to leave three people dead. Uh, and that's really when John F. Kennedy has his come to Jesus moment and realizes that Thaddeus Stevens was not the maniac that he was taught at Harvard University and that the, the segregationist governors who he's dealing with think of him as Thaddeus Stevens and his brother, the Attorney General, as Thaddeus Stevens. Um, 1963 is going to be Birmingham, uh, the March on Washington, Kennedy's June 11th speech, the, the publication of the fire uh, next time, um, and, and uh, the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, September 15th of 1963, and of course the Kennedy assassination, November 22nd, 63. And then of course in 64, it's the Freedom, it's the freedom Summer, Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman become probably the most well-known martyrs of the movement uh, in the summer of uh, 1964, and the Civil Rights Act is passed July 2nd, 1964. And then 65 is gonna be um, Selma to Montgomery demonstration, uh, Bloody Sunday uh, on March um, uh, 5th, and then uh, March 7th is Turnaround Tuesday, and then Lyndon Johnson does his We Shall Overcome speech on March 15th, which leads to the passage of the Voting Rights Act on August 6th. And in between that, Dr. King does his very famous, that's one of, Dr. King does two speeches that are publicly uh, uh, televised live. One is the March on Washington speech, and the other is the Selma speech, um, uh, uh, the Montgomery speech, rather, in, um, on March 25th, 1965. And that's the speech where King really, in a lot of ways, talks about citizenship and dignity um, simultaneously, really for the first time, and then we're gonna see sort of this revolutionary king, always nonviolent, but by 66, 67, 68, King is trying to desegregate uh, Chicago. Uh, by 67, King at the Riverside Church um, says that the United States is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, and he really comes out as this revolutionary, and really by 68, he's organizing a poor people's campaign with poor whites, and, and, and Mexican Americans and, and, and black folks from Mississippi and Native Americans um, and others. So profound, that second one is that second reconstruction. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. And again, I, I say in the book, the second reconstruction is how we get to 
President um, Barack Obama <laughs> yes. and how we get to the current moment. Thank you. Sir? Yep. Well, Dr. Joseph, um, if I understand you correctly, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, we're either the third reconstruction either just ended with um, the death of George Floyd and the, the protests that we all saw in, in 2020, or we're still living in it. So my, my question to you is, if we're living in the third reconstruction, and you mentioned that the reconstructionists won the narrative during the second reconstruction, what can we do today to similarly win the narrative of, of the day? I mean, should we focus on voting rights? Should we focus on climate change? Should we focus on um, female reproductive rights? Should we just pick one issue and go with it? Or is there one issue that you would elevate above all others that we should, we should concentrate on that would help us, um, um, as you said, win the narrative? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, I would say it's really focusing on how we come to view each other as human beings. And I would say viewing black people as human beings is the common denominator of that. Because I think when we think about black citizenship and dignity, what's so important there is that even the Reconstruction Amendments, they help out other groups of people, right? Before 1868, there is no birthright citizenship. So when we think about all these immigrants who have come from any single country on the planet, they are citizens if they're born here because of the fight against racial slavery, right? And remember, 200,000 black people fight in that war, in the Civil War. So I think what, what we should be focused on is all those things that you mentioned, mm -hmm. but I think we, our default in this country because of the history that we have is, is uh, anti-blackness. That's our default, our default. It's, it's sort of sewn constitutively into how we imagine right and wrong, good and bad, good and evil, right? And so the only way to get out of that is to confront why that is. And that's why I say this, this idea of a reconstructionist narrative versus a redemptionist narrative, even when we think about the, the battle in K through 12 schools, right? Um, for so long, for much of our history, people were taught a redemptionist narrative of American history, not just the Civil War, but American history. And that redemptionist narrative was a narrative that marginalized and dehumanized not just black people, but Native American people. It dehumanized people of color. And that was the history we were taught. We were taught to say that, hey, you know, the, the founders were great, the frontiers people were great, but remember, in, his, in the history books, they were all white. They were all white. Like, you're, you're never there unless you're some kind of um, victim or criminal or something, right? And we have to tell a different story. And I think the reason why something like the 1619 Project was so important, and it is so important, and I'm trying to do uh, my, my, my own um, contribution here with this book, The Third Reconstruction, is that it, it allows us to tell a different story that centers different actors, right? And if you, if you tell a different story about the way in which you've historically had, yes, structures and systems of racism, but you've also had a huge group led by black people, but that's multiracial and multigenerational that are resisting that and trying to create this beloved community, that's what's gonna be um, our most powerful antidote because Again, the stories we tell ourselves about us, the United States, that's what leads to policy. That's what leads to politics. That's why, you know, when you, when you look at the period of 1963 to 2013, the reason why that is so important is that that racial justice consensus is a story that multiple presidents and leaders say even though they're gonna have different strategies and tactics, right? Telling a different story starting in 2017 has hurt all of us. It's hurt all of us. And you can't rebound in, 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 in four years or eight years. It's gonna take, now our life's work is to try to tell this story about American history that can lead to some kind of consensus. The consensus is always gonna be imperfect because it's different voices. We can, we can disagree with each other 
without killing each other at our best, without name calling at our best, uh, without um, demonizing and demonizing each other at our best. So I think the key is gonna be narratives because even when, everything you've mentioned, reproductive rights and reproductive justice, voting rights, when we think about things like immigration, environmental justice that uh, Deidre, Deidre mentioned, these are all stories. The only way we connect with those, people say, let me tell you a story about, okay? So storytelling is the, po is, is the power that we all have. That's, that's the most powerful thing that we all have. And we have to fit our own story within the larger story of the United States and the world, I believe. But here, I start with the United States. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Good evening. And, you know, I, my question is a little bit more personal in nature, going, maybe speaking to the memoir part, portions of your book, mm -hmm. that um, uh, you, 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 as you mentioned, you are a, a uh, kid of Haitian immigrants, grew up, born and raised <laughs> in New York City, and, and, I, and now you live and teach in Texas, yeah. which is a deeply red state, yeah. and... <laughs> You know, I'm curious as to your experiences, you know, sort of being, you know, growing up in New York, sort of um, where multiculturalism, you know, do, during that, doing, you know, when you came of age was, was more embraced um, as opposed to being now being in Texas, a red state where a lot of these things are just being challenged, yeah. hook, line, and sinker. And, uh, and, and your story is kind of the opposite of mine. I grew up in Texas and now I live in the DMV. And I think about everything that's going on back in Texas, like, oh my God, how embarrassing. I can't even, you know, I, I, I'm so embarrassed for my home state. So I'm just kind of curious if you can talk about sort of the experiences of, experiences of black folk and Latinos in a red state in this third reconstruction. Yeah, no, thank you, David. I, you know, I think, I think that their story is similar to all of our stories. I think that um, one, I think Texas is really the, one of the most diverse really it's the most diverse state in, in the country in certain ways. And when you, when you read a book like Annette Gordon-Reed's Juneteenth and you, you look at sort of Texas's really polyglot history, you see that there's, there's another way that Texas could, could really be. Like Texas has, um, you know, it starts off as sort of um, it, indigenous people are there. It becomes um, sort of a colony of Spain and then Mexico. Um, and then uh, America and American uh, uh, frontiers folks, you know, take it over when we think about the Mexican-American War. And really, a lot, that war, 1841 to 1845, this is where storytelling matters. I grew up where they told us that that story, the Mexican-American War, was a story of liberation. It was a story of, you know, um, uh, white settlers not wanting to be under the yoke of Mexican colonialism. They didn't tell us anything about slavery was connected to Texas, not at all. They didn't tell us that really the, folk, the, 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 the main reason why folks were, were battling is that they wanted um, Texas as their own empire uh, to cultivate plantation slavery, which they do um, over the next couple of decades. Texas is the last place to surrender during the Civil War, the last place, mm -hmm. the last battle of the Civil War it's not Appomattox Courthouse, not in Texas, not in Texas. And that's why Galveston in June 19th, uh, you know, Juneteenth is so important. Um, you know, it's, it's fought outside of Brownsville, Texas in, in, in as late as May. And there's still skirmishes that continue throughout 1865 uh, in Texas. So Texas is a, is, a, is a hard place in a lot of ways, but Texas is also a beautiful place in a lot of ways. There's, there's a huge history of indigenous people, of, of um, Mexican uh, and, and sort of the, a Tejano culture in Texas. There's a huge history of black folks in Texas. And, and there's also a history of, of uh, white folks who are interested in abolition democracy in Texas. They've been a minority in Texas, but they've existed, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think during this third reconstruction, they're, they're there, they're absolutely there. And not just in Austin and in the cities. You know, I do, I do talks, I just was in Georgetown, Texas, and they're everywhere, they're everywhere, even though they might not be a numerical majority. And one of the things we can see with Texas, Texas has been a site where you have 
both voter suppression, but you've also had Barbara Jordans in Texas, right? So there's, there's that dual reconstructionist um, legacy and that redemptionist legacy. And what's so interesting is that sometimes when people think that the redemptionist legacy is winning out, it's really um, the high before the fall. Because when you think about the second reconstruction, for example, um, in a lot of ways, Jim Crow and racial segregation uh, seemed uh, to be infinite and that it was going to last in that specific way forever. And then sort of the walls came tumbling down, um, at least enough to provide uh, a framework for um, black excellence and achievement um, and other groups as well, right? So that's very, very important. I think during this third reconstruction, that, that's still occurring. I think without the ferment of the activism of 2020 and that came before, uh, you wouldn't see the progress that we've made um, so far. And I think we have to also think uh, optimistically and, and, and talk about some of the progress that has been made, right? I think everything that's happened since George Floyd, um, including the taking down of some Confederate flags, including um, a different presidential administration and some of the policies that have been passed, all that is owed to the ferment of, of so many people who came out um, to organize and not just vote. Because voting is the tip of the sphere. You're only voting in the context of after you feel like you have the dignity to access your citizenship. And that's why sometimes when people say vote, yeah, I say vote too, but before people vote, we, we want them to have an understanding um, and an appreciation um, of the responsibility of, of, of just being a human being and being, being a citizen, right? And so in a lot of ways, what we want are engaged citizens. And so many people were reading so many books they were, they were interacting with so many people um, that I think future, future historians are gonna look at 2020 as sort of this profoundly transformational uh, moment in time in American history, even as I understand and get it that we're facing a backlash. Mm -hmm. But what people who are not as well versed in history don't understand is that even right after the Civil War, there was a backlash of 1866, 1867, led by President Andrew Johnson, and then by 1868, 1869, that's when you get the so-called radical Republicans. And they're not radical, everybody. They called them radical because they thought of black people as human beings. That's why they called them radical. They are not radical. All they are, and Thaddeus Stevens is really the exemplar here, is folks who believed in dignity and citizenship for black people. That's all. They weren't radical. They didn't want to destroy the country. And remember, it's, it's, black, it's black reconstructionists during the first reconstruction who invent the public school system. This is all documented. Who invent public hospitals, infrastructure, all the things that we take for granted. And that's why um, the South Carolinian, uh, South Carolinian um, uh, congressman, who's very, very light-skinned congressman too, um, he could have passed for white in certain contexts, but didn't Thomas Miller uh, has the plaint, we were eight years in power, yes. right? And, and Ta-Nehisi, of course, named his book, We Were Eight Years in Power. But what Thomas Miller is saying, he's at the 1895 South Carolinian Convention that has been called purposefully to disenfranchise black voters. So he's one of six delegates that are called to disenfranchise black voters. And he says, we were eight years in power, we rebuilt up the levees, we funded schools, we did all this, and he says, I'm standing here today, and you're gonna disenfranchise us from the reforms that we institutionalize. Right? So that, that, that's part of American history, and we, we need to know that. It's like Tom Hanks wrote the New York Times op-ed saying how he was upset that he didn't know about Tulsa, right? Mm -hmm. And Tom Hanks is Mr. America, World War II, the Founding Fathers. He loves us, <laughs> he loves us to death. He loves us, right? And he's saying he wanted to know about Tulsa and the 300 bl black people who were murdered in Tulsa, the Black Wall Street, uh, Greenwood, because of his love for the country. He's a critical thinker, and he said, if I had known that growing up in the Oakland public schools, there are certain things in my life in certain ways I would have been different, and I would have had more understanding of what was going on. You know? So he's, he just, he's stepping into the present, 
And of course, as a young person, you wonder, why is there segregation? Why is all this stuff like this, right? But you don't understand the history if they're not teaching it to you, if they're too afraid to teach it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think we've got a, a few more. Well, I think we're going to add a little more time. To think. Okay. Um, just a little. Uh, we got. <laughs> we have several questions here and several questions here. How about you? Sure, Dr. Joseph. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'm also glad to know that there's so many Texans in the room. I'm also a Texan. Um, I actually Texas went to is everywhere. Uh, everywhere. There's almost 30 Texas million of us. So, <laughs> um, I'm actually. I actually went to a little HBC across the street from where you teach at uh, Houston Tillotson. Oh, love Houston Tillotson. I've yeah. spoken at there, and I love. We 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 connect. And the former president, Dr. Colette Pierce Burnett, one of my one of my good friends. Yes, doing so many great things. Um, and so on the topic of conversation about education and Houston Tillotson in Texas, um, I think a lot about debt. Um, and I'm curious to know what debt, how, how debt figures into your understanding of the third reconstruction. Um, when it comes to Houston Tillotson, for instance, um, in 1876, you know, Texas wrote our new constitution. Um, and in that constitution, we have the Permanent University Fund, um, where they stole two million acres of West Texas land and they decided they're gonna make money on that and give it to the public universities, which is how you know, UT Austin and yep. other UT schools are funded. But one year before uh, they wrote that constitution in 1875, you have Houston Tillotson, um, obviously two colleges at that point um, was founded, um, left out of that compact and not funded to this day by the state of Texas. Um, and so I often feel that HBCUs, not just Houston Tillotson, but the other eight across the state of Texas are owed a whole lot. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I guess I'm just curious to know, you know, uh, we also have the conversation about student debt too, you know, today um, yeah. and how that impacts a lot of young people. So just curious to know where you think debt figures into, you know, this reconstruction conversation. Oh yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I think it figures in deep and I, I agree with you in terms of Houston Tillotson. And I think that this idea of repair and reparations is really an important conversation uh, to have. I mean, both at the national level and at the state and local level. Uh, student debt is connected to this in this way, that as we desegregated or racially integrated um, public universities, both states and the federal government started to defund those public universities. So when we think about this idea, when people talk about defund the police, they've been defunding stuff for a long time, just not what, what people might want. So there's been defund uh, the university. Um, you know, I went to Stony Brook University in New York State, and uh, you know, uh, uh, for many, many years before Stony Brook started to have more black students, that was a place that was virtually free to go to. Uh, by the time you started to see racial integration, that's when you started to see the pullback from um, state governments and the federal government. So student debt, which is disproportionately um, uh, hurts black and brown students who a lot of times have less financial access have less financial means from their, their families, less generational wealth, um, and take up you know, huge, huge amounts of loans, which then further um, burdens them uh, in ways where they're never gonna be able to buy a house, they're never gonna be able to sort of live and experience the American dream. It's absolutely a racial equity issue. It absolutely is a racial equity issue. And it's connected, you know, a great book is the Heather McGee book, The Sum of Us Here. And she starts that book by saying, why can't we have nice things, right? She says, why can't we have nice things like you know, healthcare and just access for all? And really, you know, her answer is that you know, our, our long history with race uh, and racism prevents us from having nice things. And she, she recounts has how places would shut down public swimming pools. Um, hundreds of places did this. Uh, rather than allow uh, black and white kids to go and swim together, swimming pools. I mean, Jesus, swimming pools, right? And they, the, these swimming pools have not been reopened. So one of the things, you know, when we talk about the second reconstruction and winning that narrative war, we didn't, it's, it's imperfect. We didn't win everything because if we had, we would have reopened those swimming pools, right? We would have reopened those swimming pools and had points of contact with each other. And so, no, I think debt is, is real. And I do think that when we think about that debt, we, we have to tell a story about you know, how, um, how that debt and, 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 and repaying that debt can help all of us, right? Because certainly black people will be aided, but when you think about public education, it can help everyone, right? So part of it is telling that story. And I think that 
sometimes what, you know, the, the Obama versus BLM thing, I think there's a middle ground in this sense that Obama felt that, um, you know, he couldn't talk about black issues, period, you know, as president of the United States. Because if he talked about black issues, he was going to be accused of being reverse racist and all this stuff. And he was criticized for, for that, and I think rightfully so, because there are a bunch of constituent groups in the United States. There are Jewish groups who ask you for something. There are labor groups that ask you. So truly, as president, there's all these groups, special interest groups asking for stuff. So you can't say the only special interest group I'm not going to listen to are black people. You can't, you, do you understand what I mean? You know, there, 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 are, there are tons of people who want stuff from you, right? And that's why we're, you know, you know, the whole idea of a melting pot, but the big word for it is pluralism. Pluralism is that this idea that we all have special interest groups and we're all trying to lobby on behalf of our own group, right? And sometimes we have interests that converge, interest group convergence, right? But, but in, in a lot of ways, race prevents uh, interest group convergence in a lot of ways in the United States. Certainly it did during the first Reconstruction, but I think people would be surprised at how resilient that is right now. You know, there's so many different um, ways. Uh, you know, Lee Atwater said, you know, uh, uh, who was uh, George H.W. Bush's campaign manager and mastermind behind the Willie Horton ads, he said that, you know, in the 60s, you could use the N-word, the N-word, the N-word. By the 80s, that hurts you, so you start using words like um, law and order. So you start using words like, um, I'm going to cut your taxes. And he, says, he said um, that the end result is that these are policies that hurt blacks more than whites, right? But the thing is, the interesting part is that they still hurt whites, these policies. They, they do. Even the rise of mass incarceration from where we were in 1980 has impacted um, um, white men and women uh, in the drug war in different places. They get arrested more than they used to as well. Not at the same rate, you know, not at the same rate. It, it's sometimes, I've seen drug war stats where it's eight times more, where black folks is 28 times more, Latinx folks is 21 times more. But it's still more than before. So even the whole idea of the carceral state and mass incarceration and what we do there has actually impacted white communities as well. So having a story where the only way we can fulfill ourselves is through punishment and exploitation actually impacts all of us. And that's why King was talking to us about the beloved community, because he said, what if we told ourselves a different story? What if we told ourselves a story about ending uh, punishment, ending what he called militarism, racism, and materialism? What, were the, what would be the consequences of telling that different story? And remember, throughout our history, we've had people who have actually have pursued and enacted that different story. You know, um, both, both at the grassroots level, but also um, um, at the national level, right? And it's not, it's, it's going to be people like Rabbi Heschel. It's going to be people like Bobby Kennedy. There's, there's so many different um, uh, people in that, in that sense, Gloria Steinem. There's going to be so many people who actually have tried to tell this different story. And when we tell that different story, you get different outcomes. One outcome is the 64 Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And when we think about the 64 Civil Rights Act and then 72 in terms of Title VII, Title IX, that's how we get women's um, intercollegiate sports funded, right? We, we told ourselves a different story about the value of women that has turned really into this multi-billion dollar industry and has really impacted so many young girls and women who otherwise, in that earlier iteration of the country, never would have had a chance to play sports. We, we used to say, women, you, you shouldn't play sports, right? Because we were telling ourselves a story about their value and their worth. So it really matters telling ourselves these different stories. Absolutely. Um, I think we have a question here. Um, sir? Hi, I'll preface my question by saying I haven't read your book. I got an email, I saw a compelling title, and I said, let me check this out. But uh, you opened by describing the Reconstructions as periods of uh, social progress followed by uh, some violence and things of that nature. I certainly agree, I think, to the first Reconstruction about you know, Robert Smalls and black congressmen, something that blew my mind. I didn't know about it, I read about it, blew my mind. But then followed by the resurgence of the KKK and yeah. events like uh, bloody, the Bloody Summer. Right. I see, in a way, this re Reconstruction reminds me of the saying, two steps forward, one step back. 
Yeah. Right. I look at the second reconstruction. I see two steps forward, one step back. A lot of good, a lot of bad collective forgetfulness. Right. And I think that in many ways leads to the next reconstruction when we as a society forget what should be, what could have been the progress we made, we made decades ago. So now I look at the third reconstruction. It's fresh. Right. It's only a few years old. We're making progress. There's some negatives that are rising to the top. Right. So my question is not a question. I'm going to ask you to predict the future. Right. Um, That's always tough for his. When this third reconstruction settles, there'll be some good, there'll be some bad. I hope you don't have to write a book called the fourth reconstruction. No, I right? hope so I too, want right? I want us to solidify and to never forget. I'm in the military. I I have a job where we walk in and there's a poster. It says today is sep is September 12th, 2001. Yeah. Right. It evokes a feeling. I remember what it was like the day the Twin Towers came crashing down, and yeah. today's the day after. I'm I'm fired up. Right? I want us to never forget the third reconstruction. Right? So when this dust settles, what do you see this country looking like? And then I guess more importantly, how can we solidify the progress we're making now to make sure that there isn't a fourth reconstruction? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great question. I, I think what it looks like is that we're on the road towards um, justice and building a beloved community for all people. Uh, I think the way in which we get there is a combination of um, grassroots organizing uh, and politics from below uh, and the politics from above, but we can co-create that world. That's what I'm saying. I mean, I, I'm convinced that the stories that we share with each other can be a huge, huge part of this, whether people are religious, whether they're secular, um, you know, whether they're connected to their parents um, or, excuse me, their children's PTA groups, whatever you're in, you know, nonprofits, you're in the military, and the military actually has a role to play here, nonviolently, by the way. Um, when we think about this third reconstruction, what I hope we think about in the future is that we turned away from systems of punishment and exploitation. You know, um, Brian Stevenson, who's you know, you know, really a, a, a gem and one of my heroes, and I've, I've had an opportunity to meet him, but he, he, he talks about uh, this idea of, of just mercy, right? This idea of just mercy, but not just as a concept, but as something that should be institutionalized into our laws and our entire society. And he's argued before the Supreme Court that it's cruel and uh, inhumane punishment to have uh, kids as young as 13 uh, spend the rest of their lives in prison. And, and he's won that argument in 2012. So I think the way in which it looks, if we don't have to do this again, is that we, we don't have 20% um, uh, of the world's prisoners, even though we're 5% of the world, right? Um, the way it looks is that we don't have the same specific uh, rates of child poverty that we have in this country. We don't have the rates of mass incarceration and racial segregation uh, in this country. Um, it looks like a more just country that, it's, that, that is on its way to um, more justice, right? And achieving, really, you know, for the first time, we, you know, we've never, you know, James Baldwin talked about achieving our country in the fire, in the fire next time. And what he meant by that was that we, we, we have these lofty ideals and the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. We have these, these, these sort of grand pronouncements of who we are. Um, and a lot of times there's a, a, a huge gap, a yawning chasm between the rhetoric and the reality. And it becomes moving closer to that reality um, in everything that we, that we do. And of course, we will know it because we know all the issues and the problems um, that, we, that we actually have, right? And so I do think, though, that that is possible. I do think that in certain spaces, that's already been made. I mean, there are fugitive spaces where people have, have undergone immense transformation and are, are co-creating those beloved communities. We've not been able to do it at that national transformational level that in, in certain periods we are. I mean, I think the first reconstruction is one. I think the New Deal uh, is another. I think the second reconstruction and parts of the Great Society are another. Um, and I do think in 2020, 
we were co-creating something. I think that uh, if you look at that summer, there was so much energy, both uh, from, from below and above. Um, some of that energy has dissipated. Some of it has been contravened by backlash. But it was there, you know, I felt it, you all felt it too, even amidst the pandemic, there was so much uh, tremendous um, hope. And in a way, that hope actually has led us to this point. So we, 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 we have to remain optimistic and we have, to tell, um, we have to tell a different story. And again, that story, when I say different, it's still part of our American history. It's still us, but it's, we have to be willing to tell the, the bitter and beautiful parts of our story in service of a transformation that can fundamentally hold. But as we've seen with democracy, even if we get to the point that we're talking about, we're still gonna have to work at it and earn it. You know? So this is a lifelong relationship, democracy. You know, it's not falling in love and say, hey, <laughs> it's gonna take care of itself now. I'm good, <laughs> right? It's, it's something different. And so I think we can get there and we have to strive to get there, uh, whether it takes several lifetimes or beyond that. I think, I think time wise. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry? Time wise, I think. Oh, we, yeah. we're, uh, we're running very close to the yeah. end. I, yeah. I did want, if you could just um, say what you're, just quickly, all three of you say, um, give us your question, and then we'll just, some, we'll have a quick summary, and then, you, then, then we've got other instructions for you about the book. and. Hope you have a wonderful evening. So very quickly, sir. Okay, it's no problem. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming here. Uh, you're every, like just the concept of a third reconstruction is so powerful. Um, it's really greatly appreciated. My question is really, um, how does social media play into this third reconstruction? And how does it differ from what the second reconstruction in the way that um, people organized and the way that we all built our, co our coalitions. How does that um, compare to what's going on now when social media is now, it's, it's a factor and it not only can empower communities, it can organize communities, but at the same time, it could also create division when there's also yep. more like um, interference um, in, in that organization. And there can be a lot of confusion and misinformation. It's a lot more easier now to get misinformation. Well, let me not say it's not, it's a lot more easy, because it's also easier to find the information as well, but. So I, I, I got it, I'm good. Okay, and then the ma'am, you bring your question forward. Okay, I wrote this down. Um, <laughs> it's interesting to me that you think the third reconstruction has already started, because each previous reconstruction has a strongly mobilized and organized black slash multiracial movements with uh, clear agendas and um, tremendous intangible gains, which I don't think we've seen yet. So my question is, why or what has you so convinced that the third reconstruction has already happened? Because I personally would say that we're in a renaissance period and that the third reconstruction hasn't started yet. Okay, yeah, great. And then this here. Okay, mine's really short. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here and uh, Okay, here we go. So my question is, what are a couple of the best lessons from this reconstruction to direct and inspire the youth to um, keep this going? Okay, great. Um, okay, so very quickly for all three. So social media is hugely important. I think the positives, it's been able to mobilize people on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I think the negatives, people's attention span is short. Um, I think the negatives are sometimes people um, can try to cut off people who they feel have made mistakes on social media. Um, and sometimes we call that cancel culture. The biggest cancel culture is obviously voter suppression and, and, and laws against critical race theory. But social media among um, young people can also make people um, overly critical of people who do make mistakes. So we, we have to be willing to um, have a politics of forgiveness for people who make mistakes because we all make mistakes. Um, in terms of the third reconstruction, no, absolutely. I would say we're, we're having it. And I think people, I think that we have to understand that 2008 to the present, there's been huge, enormous transformation. Enormous. 
um, what, what, what both MAGA and BLM do is tell two different stories of redemptionism and reconstructionism. And both of them, at various points, win the argument. 